Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we approach you today asking you to have mercy upon us and forgive us of every single wrong that we have ever done. We ask of you for this forgiveness by asking you to change us and make us different within. We also ask of you to blot out all our past sins when our names come up before the judgment. And while the work of sanctification is going on in us, we ask of you to prepare us to face the terrible events that are about to strike this world. Help us not to lose courage, but to keep the faith of Jesus Christ when the dead and dying will be all around us. But loving Father, equip us in such a way to give the light of truth to many others that they may accept the truth and be saved as the end draws near. All these mercies we ask of you and thank you for hearing us and blessing us with these requests through Christ our Savior. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Doing two things. We will review the most essential part of the plan of salvation that determines you having the real gospel. And also, this evening, we will have our state of the world address. And I have a whole set of tracks here that I prepared to give to you all. And it is in harmony with what will be spoken about for our uh, state of the world address this evening. Okay? We have a whole set here. Um, we also would like to say welcome to the brethren in St. Vincent. They have all gotten together from the two churches in St. Vincent into one place. And they are on Skype. They're waving to you. And right now they are waving, I'm told. <laughs> right? They are on Skype and they are viewing this whole service here. Okay? So we say hello to the brethren in St. Vincent from the two churches that are together there. Okay? Uh, they are all waving. And we say hello to them, okay? All right. Also, we are we are supposed to be connected to England, okay? Uh, we are the brethren here also are paying close attention. Also, we are supposed to be connected to uh, to California and also New Jersey, if I if I'm correct. Here. New Jersey also, and also from Tobago too, right? So the brethren in Tobago are paying attention also. So put it this way, this is like a small conference. We won't be able to have connection with the brethren in Pakistan because their time zone is completely different to our time zone. Okay, brethren? But they are very far away. But today we want to, as you see on the board here, observe the name of our topic, Structured Principles that Form the Real Gospel 2012 Review. We want to look at what makes of the real gospel. If you don't have this, you don't have the real gospel. This is what we want to look at. But there are certain structural principles that make up the gospel. If you don't have those principles, you don't have the real gospel. You see, my dear brethren, the problem with the evangelical churches and the problem with the traditional Adventist organization is that much of these structured principles that determine what makes the real gospel have been lost among them. And what we want to do, we want to make sure that we get a proper understanding from the Bible as to the nature of the real gospel. Without the gospel, you cannot be saved. But if you are to be saved by the gospel, it might well be the real gospel. What do we say? Amen. Now, God cannot be using you if you are preaching falsehood. Amen? Amen? If you have a false gospel, amen? amen? But the real gospel has a certain shape and a certain image and a certain feature and a certain structure. And it is this structure we want to look at today in part. We want to get an idea of the structure of the real gospel so that you, the next time, when you investigate yourself, you will ask yourself, is it this that I believe? If it is this that you believe, praise God for that. Amen, brethren? Amen. Right? So let me just quickly go through some of the points here with you on the board. And then we will get into our scripture and start doing our research. Point number one on the board here, you see, there must be in this or internal or inner change first 
Notice the word in his, and notice the word first is underlined. If the change doesn't come first, if there is no change in you first, then with all the change you are still the same. Amen? Amen. Amen. Therefore, all the outside works will only be what? Come on, will only be what? Formal escape, which means you only have a theory of the truth. Is that not so? Yes. If there is no change within first, then all the outside works will only be what? <laughs> will be what? Hypocritical or only be what? <laughs> pretense. It will only be a pretense. If there is no change inside first, then all the outward uh, forms will merely be what? It will be what? Not substantial or what? Not real. Is that understood? And this is the reason it is critical and it is crucial that anybody that teaches the everlasting gospel to you must tell you that there must be an endless change out first. Is that understood? And I tell you, none of the evangelicals teach that. This the Adventist church has been going away from. And if you tell the whole some segments of that, they do not understand it as the Bible teaches it. So we want to make sure we gain our understanding from where? From the Bible. I got a document recently online, and the document is written by a Seventh-day Adventist minister from the ministry magazine. And in it, he is identifying two types of gospel, gospel plural, in the Adventist church. One where they teach everything is completely outside of you. And the other one, he says, that one teaches a change. And, it, and when he begins to question which of the two is the, is the real gospel, he says neither. <laughs> it is somewhere in between. Now try and think about an in-between to not change and an in-between to change. What is that? That's something our imagination can't even fathom, amen? amen? And that's what he's telling us in a ministry magazine article. Now, point number two. If it is the real gospel, watch me, sins within must be forgiven how? First. So that the person will be forgiven when? In the judgment. That pattern is the pattern that the Bible teaches concerning the gospel, and we will see that. Because some people tell, tell you this, I accept Christ Jesus. What happened to you? God forgive me for all that I've ever done. That's what they tell you. So then you mean to say, the things you've done 50 years ago have been forgiven, yes. So God dealt with your past first, yes. What about you? But I'm not struggling. Do you see that teaching? They made God concentrate on the results of the problem first. And halfway fix the problem. And they call that the real gospel. But we are going to look beyond that and see what our Bible teaches us. Amen, Amen. 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 And they see that the Bible tells us the first thing God deals with is what is the problem. Amen? Amen. And where the problem is. Amen? And the problem is not the lie that he did two years ago. The problem is the values of the mind. Amen? Amen. Because if the values are still there, they're going to be lying every two, minute, every two minutes later. Amen? Amen? And they're going to have a whole mountain of half lies. With also the sin still in you. Now, point number three. This part here, this point here is the point that determined what was the Reformation. And this point here is absolutely, it is the core center of the gospel. As I often tell you, if there is one thing you need to make sure you are, you are teaching right, first of all, if there is one thing you need to make sure you are teaching right, first of all, it is this. That the righteousness of God, which is what? God himself. Must be there. Because in your converted person, by your what? Faith of Jesus Christ. Did you get that? So that the man may keep what? The righteousness of the law. That is not a teaching in the Adventist church at all. That is not a teaching. Ask the Adventist church about that, they will tell you, well, um, here is what they will tell you. Come, come, church, come. Let them pass your hand, come and sit. 
Congress is voting over a bill. And as the congressman is reading out the bill, he's on the interest. He said, good Lord, this also is classified. Have you ever heard you voting on a bill that is classified? Are you voting on it? But in the, in the bill, they reveal certain shocking things. Pieces. Part of the pieces shows that there's a new virus out. And whatever the virus does, it causes the human beings to become flesh eating. Literally, you will hear it on television from Congress. And they are expecting more than 80% of the people in America to be infected. But as they read saying it, they just say, this is classified, this is classified, so they're cutting it out. I ask myself, if something like that is happening, what does that have to do with this? Because they speak about martial law, they speak about the army taking over, all of that, right? The bill is supposed to vote on. And the last thing he said is that a new bill of rights, right? Yeah. Will be ratified by, that's classified. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, all over the world, a new disease called excited delirium has started to take hold of people. And people, ordinary people walking just, just start to feel inside of them burning up. And they rush and grab somebody and start to eat the person, literally fresh walk while they're alive. That has started happening right here in this country. And I can even tell you, it is an engineered rabies virus. This is telling you what is going on. We are living in the closing scenes of this earth's history. Amen? Amen. And danger, as Mrs. White says, will be all around you. Therefore, you need to prepare. Amen, brethren? Amen. But the best preparation is if you have the yes. gospel of Jesus Christ. The real gospel. What do you think? Amen. And that is what we want to make sure we have. Okay? So. Yes, as the sisters said, we are so we can teach us. Right? The person will know that they get it, they start feeling all inside of you good enough, start ripping off your clothes, they go like in that chance, and then they and just biting. start biting, biting and biting. attacking the bird nearby. nearby. And I'm telling you, you will find it strange like a deal of the dead picture. But this is real, it has happened in Europe. I watched a government footage, I can't show this one on television because I didn't want to show you. But I watched a government footage from Russia. We have an army man as a machine gun and he's shooting the people with it. Yes. And about five to six people are running him down. And they're not just dying. The one in Miami, they had to shoot the man several times to stop him from eating the other people. And in this one in Russia, although they're using this machine gun, shooting people, the people refuse to drop. And by the time the man dropped the machine gun and they hold him, Video footage which you can't show them, they actually show them tearing man for the Six of them. This one happened in Russia. We also have footage of it in China. Some of them are very bloody. So we will only be able to show some on television, but we, that was the next program to prepare because we are letting you know that trouble is coming. What do you say, Bernie? But I don't want to talk much about these things later on when we give the State of the World Address. You'll be shocked to see what state your world is. You think it's only Indonesia sinking? Trinidad and Tobago is sinking all the Trouble is coming. But then this is the end. How long do you want to live on this age? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But we'll talk about that later on. Okay? But I refer that to let you know our only security is in doing the real world. The of Jesus Christ. God has put his, his throne on the line to protect those who are his people. What do you say? Amen. And this is the reason why whatsoever we ask of him, we receive of him because he will keep his commandment and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Amen, brother. So now, let us start off with Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. In your Bible. Oh. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Often you read those scriptures, but do you read those scriptures and get the idea of what it is really saying? Do you really understand what those scriptures are really saying? Let's read up on Romans 1, 16 and 17. But we're not looking at every last thing here. We're looking at a major point in those scriptures. You must have helped the neighbor find it if you don't know where to look next door. Make sure they find Romans 1, 16 and 17. And then let's start. We read. For I am not ashamed of the what? Gospel of Christ. For it is the what? Power of God unto salvation to everyone that what? Yes. Did you just see that there? To everyone that believes. So who must believe? We must believe. We are the ones that must believe. To everyone that believes it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now why? Why is it the power of God and the salvation? And by the way, the word power there is the Greek word dunamis. And the word dunamis means dynamics. That is how something works, the science of something, how it works. So we are being told by Paul that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the dynamics of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Condition is, you must believe. And then it tells us why it works. It says, for daring. Daring. What did it say? Daring. For daring is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall walk. In other words, the gospel of Christ works because the righteousness of God is in it. If the righteousness of God is not in it, it will not work. Amen? And it will become a theory of the truth. So the next time somebody come and say like an Adventist, who all the two years are saying by knowledge. <laughs> That's what they say. All they say by knowledge. We say by a personal experience of Christ. So now that? let's try and get to Personal experience. He's not there physically. He's not physically hugging you. That won't save you anyhow. So what's the personal experience? Is it in your mind? Yes. Is it in your mind as a knowledge of? Well, yes. Come again, we are saved by what? <laughs> Did you just see that? But we are told the gospel of Christ works because the righteousness of God is where? Amen. It is. And that is why it is crucial for you to get the righteousness of God right. The Roman Catholic Church for centuries thought that the righteousness of God was God's retribution. And as a result of that, if you want to get success, you have to take penalty. So Roman Catholic monks will be fallegating themselves on their back, walking up on their on, on stairs on their knees looking for forgiveness. Until it was discovered that the righteousness of God is God himself. Amen. And that is what makes the gospel work. The gospel works because God himself was in it, amen? amen? You see, God has found a brilliant way of giving himself to us. Yes. Since God doesn't give himself as a physical body, because God is not the body, he has found a way using spiritual truths to communicate himself to us. What do you see? Amen. And so the gospel works because the righteousness of God is where? Amen. Is. is that understood, my dear brother? Did you see that? No. What is this gospel seeking to save us from? Matthew 1.21. Matthew 1.21. Verse 21. We read. And she shall bring forth a son. Matthew 1. This is the gospel of Matthew. Chapter 1 and verse 21. It says this. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name what? Jesus. Why? 
For he shall save his people what? from their sins. Did you see that? You see, so I am listening to this evangelical preaching, and they speak a lot. This is the one that, this is the evangelical religion that came from South America. And they believe the Holy Spirit could be a glass of water. That's a universal church of God. They have taken what we call Santanera spiritualism and mix it with the form that they have that they call the gospel. So they believe they have a bottle and the bottle is the Holy Spirit and a bottle of the Holy Spirit in it. And they see they take the sins, they put it in a jar, and they take the jar and they smash it on the ground. And they get back into the um, they sin. Did you hear that one? The only thing I didn't say is very really truthful here is not sins in the jar. It's your financial problems, your health problems, your related problems, one set of problems. Not one of them want to talk about sin. They may say it's spiritual problems, but that's a different meaning to them. Huh? Nobody seems to recognize that salvation is salvation what? From sin. That is the priority. If it is sin, it's the problem. And Jesus Christ is very near means. He saves us from what? From sin. sin. Did you get that clear? Amen. That's what we're being told. See you see, when you get these ideas in your mind right, you know what has to be dealt with. Amen. If you want to come into a religion and, do, and look to get wealth and money and health and all these sort of things, overlooking sin, this is not the case. Amen. Because we deal with sin. Amen, Amen brethren? Amen. I'll take a hand just now. So I am home sitting down and the phone rings. I take up the phone. Hello? I said hello. I am looking for a pastor. My daughter is sick with some sickness in the hospital and I'm looking for prayer. So she thought the person called my number by mistake. They were looking for some evangelical pastor to pray for their daughter. <laughs> I said, well, I'm a pastor anyhow. <laughs> you understand? But she got the wrong number. <laughs> and I asked, what is wrong with the person? And then they told me what was wrong with the person after. And I said, OK, I will pray for the person. But you must do this also. And I showed them certain cures to bring to the person who was in the hospital. Amen, Amen. Amen. And when I finished praying, the faith of Jesus Christ, the person was so thankful. One would think that the person forget, but they keep the number. <laughs> because I got another call again. Amen. This time is another problem again from something else. But the phone got cut off before I was in So I'm just trying to show you. You see, they always look to, always look to deal with some sickness here. And some, some they believe sin is a spirit. You understand? Get rid of the spirits of consciousness and all these sort of things. And they don't recognize it's not a spirit. Do you know the ancient shamans actually thought that what that sin for them was evil spirits? So if you remove the evil spirits, you'll be like an angel. And that same false teaching is today part of the evangelical teaching. So let me take you to others. One, sister, go and then the other. Um, maybe you can explain this to me, right? Because I tried getting the explanation from the evangelicals and they just keep repeating the same thing over and over. They say that the Sabbath, well, they, they don't keep the Sabbath, they're Sabbath, right? Yes. Because their Sabbath, is, their rest is in Christ. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to, get, I'm trying to understand what they mean by their rest being, being in Christ. They're not keeping the Sabbath, they're holy, but because your rest is in Christ, because the Sabbath was done with it. So, I, I've never gotten an explanation from them, so maybe you can explain it, but they don't seem to know what it means. So maybe you could shed some light on it. Well, uh, in the first place, there's no scripture that can search and use in the Bible to show rest in Christ. There's not a scripture that teaches that. But the Bible does teach rest, rest from sin. You understand? Now, if they want to say it is rest from sin, then sin is transgression of the world. No. So rest in Christ would mean you're keeping the Sabbath rest. Mm. I told you the person that, and they unless, were like, but the Sabbath was done, I was like, unless, 
if they want to have rest in Christ instead of the Sabbath, then would be Isaiah kept the Sabbath, but they didn't have rest in Christ. So he is saved without Christ yeah. and his rest. So is Moses. So is all those millions of people before Christ came. So you have two plans of salvation, one before Christ come and one after Christ come. But the one after Christ come has rest in Christ instead of the Sabbath. Okay. It's so foolish, obviously. But yes, I get one. And then I was listening um, to like to the point one, that is the one with the station, right? Yeah. yeah this guy calling on the station was the pastor. Yeah. And what he was telling the pastor is that he was not working anymore. And he was here, he now began to hit his wife. So he have a written spirit, right? And so he's not working. So he, and he now he's got a written spirit. He's got a written spirit, right? And then he's the pastor tell him, well, that is not true that I take responsibility for what you do when you're wrong and you do when you're fasting because it's not great to get the spirit off of him. You see? You can spread off of him. So, as I said, my prayer is over there, you understand? Amen, amen, amen. See that? So, the wife is not working to get a beaten spirit. The beaten spirit. You didn't get a, a, a searching spirit to search for a job. Let us continue, my dear brother. Let us continue. So why did Jesus come to save us from sin? Why? We ask a simple question. The simple answer is, well, we, are, we all have sin. We all have sin. So since we all have sin, then Jesus came to save us from sin. But while that is true, the important thing we need to understand, the problem with man, the problem with man is that he is a sinner. That's the problem with man. But when you say man, you see, this is the reason why you need to understand that. Now, no offense here meant. A person is unconverted. And as the person is unconverted in the world, they are a sinner. What will they do? They will sin. That is the stage and the state that Jesus came to deal with. Is that understood? Yeah. That is what Jesus came to deal with. Because what is sin? The Bible identifies sin is what? Transgression of God's law. So what's the big deal about it? People are doing it all the time. But let me tell you something. If it wasn't for God and his work of holy angels, one sin would have already brought this world into the world. Indeed it did. So every wrong you see now, somebody breaking that person or shoot them or whatever, all that came from one sin that Adam and Eve did. And today all of us have suffered for it. And if God doesn't put his restraining hand, the whole earth will turn into chaos. Indeed, it is about to happen when the plan of salvation was going to be to finish. What do you see? And this is the reason why while it is here, you need to make sure you grab it. What do you see? Amen. And you have the real plan. What do you see? Amen. Okay, my dear brother. Look at Psalms 1 and let's see how the Bible identifies my um, sin. Psalms 1, the very first verse and then verse 5. Now notice what it tells us here. Psalms 1, 1 and then verse 5. Please help me read what's happening. Is it wrong? We read. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of whom? The ungodly. Nor standeth in the way of? Sinners. Nor sitteth in the seat of the? Scornful. Nor notice the path, nor standeth in the way of sinners. So the wicked, the scornful, are all sinners. So if you stand in the way of sinners, now stand in the way doesn't mean block them from doing their wrong. It means the way that they are walking, you are also on that way. So if you are not following them in their way, you are blessed. Now go to verse 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand where? In the judgment. Nor what? Sinners in the world. Congregation of the righteous. Did you see that? Amen. Now this clearly tells us that being a sinner is a problem. 
The problem is being a sinner. Since the problem is being a sinner, we cannot stand any judgment. Amen, brethren? Amen. Now you find people don't preach these things anymore. They're more looking at dealing with things like wealth and health and all this sickness yeah. and so on. But the issue here is that being a sinner is a problem. The question we now need to ask is, what is the problem with being a sinner? Where do we identify that problem? Being a problem, the problem is being a sinner. Where do we identify the source of that problem of being a sinner? The Bible tells us it's completely internal. And who said it but Jesus himself in Mark chapter 7? Verse 21 to 23. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Mark chapter 7, 21 to 23. Here is what Jesus tells us. Make sure you find it and make sure you read it. Is it from? We go. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed what? Evil force. What else? Adultery. What else? Fornication. What else? Murder. What else? Death. What else? Covetousness. Again. Wickedness. Again. Deceit. Again. Lasciviousness. What else? An evil eye. What else? Blasphemy. Again. Pride. Again. Foolishness. Then Jesus says, All these evil things come from where? Within. And what? Did you see that? So Jesus identifies the problem and starting where? Within. That's where the problem starts from within. And this is the reason why you see a most handsome looking man and a most beautiful looking woman and a wealthy, wealthy tycoon and a poor vagrant. And guess what? Once they're unconverted, all of them have the same problem where? Within. Did you see that? Because Jesus says all the wrongs come from within. You may see, like Syria today, look at Syria. War and bloodshed and much suffering is going on. And where has all those evil things come from? Within. That's the problem, within. And so the Bible identifies the source of the problem. Jesus himself has taken place here within the heart of man. Now some evangelicals hold his heart from here and says, from the heart. And the Bible says, well, from the heart comes evil thoughts. So the thing they think here. <laughs> oh, you understand me. Now you see, heart here is an old English word that simply means the seat of thinking, your mind. So the word heart and mind is really used in the change of the Bible. So all the evil thoughts, everything starts there in the mind, which is called the heart. And so Jesus says the problem starts from where? We say. Where does the problem start from? Amen. This is the reason why Jesus gave us our prime scripture in showing how he handles sin. Matthew 22. Okay. Just before, before you go in, just before you go there, just read one backup scripture here. Colossians 1.21. 1.21. Just read that before you go to Matthew 22. Go to Colossians 1.21. Is it from? Look at the first part of this scripture, Colossians 1.21. Did you see it? Did you see where the problem starts? Make sure you may not find it if you don't know it. It says this, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies where? In your mind. By wicked words. Did you see that? Enemies where? In, in your mind. mind. The enemy ship that we are before God starts where? In our minds. So the problem starts from where? Within. All the evil starts from the mind. 
The alienation from God it starts with the mind. The sins that we commit starts with the mind. The problem starts from within. That's what your Bible tells you. Now go to Matthew 23, where Jesus Christ lays out the principle of how salvation comes to man. Of how we plan on salvation means. Matthew 23, 25 and 26. Is it from? Now Jesus again speaking. And this is the reason why I love Jesus' words. He was always so simple. Here Jesus speaking again. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What did he call them? Hypocrites. Did you see the word on the board here? That's right. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. What did he call them? Hypocrites. So you may clean what? The outside of the cup and, and of the what? Platter. But within they are full of what? Extortion and excess. That's right. So whenever you see somebody outwardly transformed, revival and reformation in this church, and the inside is still unchanged, that person is our hypocrite. Which means their religion is our pretense. But it will also mean that the outside is a formalistic thing and the religion is only a theory. It will also mean that the religion doesn't have substance. It is not what? Real. Amen, brethren? And this is the reason why you must look at the evangelical in the eye with the truth of Christ in your mind, and you will see plenty to you. Don't let them feel that they are, um, they are a terror to you. You look them in their face with their no law and antinomian teaching, and you will see so much things. You will see a lot of unconverted people with a lot of unconverted theories who love the life that they're living, but they want to be righteous in form at the same time. Mm -hmm. They want to be saved with sin. Yes, my dear. Um, Jesus, how, how was people being saved before Jesus came to earth? And then, if those people were being saved before he came to earth, then why was it necessary for him to come? Okay, so if those people were saved before Jesus came, mm -hmm. why was it necessary for him to come? This is wonderful. Simply because of this, the plan of salvation that was taught to people before were taught in the form of animal symbols, the slaying of the lamb, and the whole feast that Israel had. That, the Bible tells us, was a shadow. That did not give an accurate picture and accurate knowledge. Now, when Jesus came, the Bible called him the Lamb of God that taken away what? Sin of the world. So Jesus came with the fullness of the life. So why was Jesus necessary? Jesus was necessary because the light that was given wasn't the light that was accurate enough to help people and it could be perverted very easily with a lot of false teachings that were going on and it was perverted. So Jesus came and gave a pure light from himself, a pure example. And this time when Jesus came, he came to teach us number one, the real nature of salvation. Number two, how God suffers for sin. You see a person kill a lamb and the lamb beat up and ball. That is a small idea of how God suffers for sin. So Jesus came and showed it to us. So why did Jesus come? Why was he necessary? It was necessary for Jesus to give a much more brighter, much more clearer, and a much more perfect life. And not, and not just only that. The Bible never tells us that Jesus is coming on the earth to teach us the way of salvation was an afterthought. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible tells us that the serpent will bruise the what? The heel of the man, but he will crush the head of the what? Serpent. The first prophecy shows that as far as God is concerned, Jesus himself was to come. But he was to come at a time that it was right. So before that time that was right for him to come, what was he, what would he do? He gave a whole set of symbols to show himself coming until the time was right. And this is the reason why when Jesus came, he said, the time is what? Fulfilled. Is that understood? So the question again is, was it really necessary for Jesus to come? Yes, by the time of Jesus, the whole animal symbols was used 
as the means of saving the Jews by them. And they had lost the message. So that was the right time for Jesus to come. Was the, uh, was the plan of God for Jesus to come in the very beginning? Yes, he was to come. What about the animal sacrifices? They were just a shadow given to teach that he would come. So the ideal is his coming. His coming is not an afterthought. The ideal is his coming. But before he comes, there must be a symbol of it to show that he would come. Right? So I am listening and I am hearing um, a Jew having a debate with an Anglican minister in England. So the Jew is saying, you just look at Ezekiel 20, where it shows that God forgives people of their sins. But look, he was forgiven people of their sins before Christ. So why do we need Christ to get forgiveness of sins? That's what the Jew was asking the Anglican minister. And the Anglican minister said, but you have a point there, and so on. He couldn't answer. He failed to show that the knowledge of forgiveness of sins is the character of Christ. And that was Christ in the Old Testament. That's what the Bible shows you. He failed to show that Christ revealed by animal symbols that the Jews had was not the adequate thing. Because the real adequate thing was Christ himself, which was prophesied to come from the beginning. He failed to show that. And as a result of that, the Jew wants to be. You see, they needed a tooth here. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Amen? Now, let's go back now to Matthew 23. Watch this. Jesus speaking. Matthew 23. Verse 25 and 26. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of what? Extortion and excess. And then what did he say? Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse what? First. Cleanse what? First. That which is where? Well. It is in. Go ahead. And the platter. That the what? Outside of them may be what? So did Jesus show you which cleansing comes first? Yes. The one where? With the same. That's right. Uh, did you see that? There must be in this change fruit. That's what Jesus should. So when Jesus is what Jesus is setting forth here is watch me. Is the order of salvation. And in the order of salvation, he says the cleansing must take place where first? Within. That's the reason why the next minute, as any Adventist. Did God forgive you of your sins? You say yes. What do you mean? He says he forgave me for all the past that I've ever done. They never tell you that he removes sins from within them fruits. They always give in the past. Why? Because they do not understand the order of salvation is cleansing should take place where? Within the fruits. If there is one principle you need to learn, and for 2012, when we had our study in the church building up there, to know, one of the emphasis was always the inward nature of salvation. And this is something that you must learn to preach when you're going to people, you're going to people's houses, you're going to talk to people and preach about salvation. Don't tell them about past sins first. Tell them about the work must be done where? In what, in what, inside of you first. That's the order that Jesus presented. Cleanse what? First, that which is within the cup and the platter. And then, all what will be dealt with. Is that understood? Amen. So Jesus shows the order of salvation is an internal cleansing first. If you don't have that, you don't have the real world. Did you hear me? If you don't have that, you don't have what? The real gospel. So the real gospel tells you that the cleansing must take place where? Within. How? First. Is that understood? Do you get that plan and get it? If you don't have that, you don't have the real gospel. So much. This is important. Is that the the, the, the problem with what is in man 
is a cru crucial area identified in the Bible. The Bible tells us man is absent of God in him. The Bible also tells us there is no Christ, no God within man. The Bible also tells us we have the, the old man within us. The Bible also tells us we have idols within us. Idols in the heart. These are the problems how the Bible identifies in different ways. Yeah. The Bible identifies in different ways. Watch it something here. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 22. Watch at Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 22. Find it. All past sins and men commit. All the mountain of past sins, it all starts with it. And that's why wisdom is where the work must be done first, Jesus said. Now look at Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. We have been told. Keep thine heart with how much? Oh, Why? For oh, out of it are the words. Issues of life. Amen, Mary? Every issue of life, everything done comes from within. What do you think? Amen. And that's why Jesus said, cleanse the heart what? First. Within what? First. Is that understood, my dear brother? Yeah. And this is the reason why, think about it. Most churches talk about revival and reformation. We need a revival, we need a reformation. If you need a revival and reformation, and the inside is not meant first, then that revival and reformation will be, will be what? For what they say, or just what? Theoretical. If you have a revival and reformation, and within is not meant first, then that revival and reformation will be what? Hypocritical or what? Pretensive. If you have a revival and reformation and the changes will start within first, then that revival and revival and reformation is what? Non-substantial or what? Revival and reformation is only when it is real. It only happens when you touch the real heart of the problem. And the problem is this in man. The values of the heart. You have to touch that first. So the real gospel tells you what is this in must be dealt with. First, did you see that, my dear brethren? Now, <coughs> let us just look at something here. Colossians 1, 27. Why would we, why would we call this? Colossians 1, 27. Col Colossians 1, 27. Why would we call this? Did you find it? We read Colossians 1.27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is what? Christ in you, you are. Why is Christ in you the hope of glory? Because the problem is the same. So if you can somehow Remove the problem from within and put Christ in you, there's hope of what? Glory to you. Because the problem is the same. Now, I want to show you a few more scriptures here where the Bible clearly shows us the issue is change within. That is what makes the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. If you are non-Christian, no change within. If you are Christian, then a change to place where? Within. Let's look and see this. We start off with 2 Corinthians 13.5. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Yeah. Is it from? 2 yeah. Corinthians 13.5. Here is what it tells us. Examine yourself. Whether you be in the faith, prove 
your own self. Know you not your own self. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except he be what? Or has he great self? If Christ is not in you, you are reprobated. So when you examine yourself to see if you are deceived, to know you are not a reprobate, Christ must be where? That is what makes it different. What makes it different is the endless, the endless change for Christ being in you. But that is not all. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 9 and verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 and verse 11. Here is what it tells us. Verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, meaning following your flesh and feelings, but in the spirit. How come? If so be that was the spirit of God dwell there in you. That's why. What makes the difference is the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, an internal change. If you are not to be in the flesh, then the Holy Spirit must be where? In, in you. Did you see that? The indwelling is what makes the difference. Go to verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell where? In you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quit your mortal bodies by his spirit that what? Well, it will in you. Did you see that? Did you see that, my dear brethren? So the Holy Spirit must dwell what? Did you see that? Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's what? None of these. So what makes it different? The Holy Spirit dwells in you. In you. If the Holy Spirit dwells in you, if anyone is changed, then you belong to God. But if in one day you're not changed, you don't belong to God. Did you see that, my dear brethren? Did you get that clear? Look at Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. It tells us, verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of what? As God had said, I will dwell where? In them. And walk where? In them. And I will be their what? God. And they shall be what? My people. So what makes God your God? The incarnate of God. What makes you these people? The incarnate of God. Therefore, the inner change is the most important thing that determines us having the real gospel. Amen, brethren? Do you get that clear? Do you get that clear? Now, our second point tells us that sins within must be forgiven first so that the past sins will be forgiven in the judgment. This is what we are told. Okay, question. Do we still have idol values in our unconscious mind that has not been addressed as yet at the point of justification? Now, idol values are values we have for things above God. If you have a value for something, and that value for that something makes you deny God, then that thing is an idol value. Now, idol value dwells in your mind. You are conscious of these idol values. However, in your unconscious mind, all the knowledge is stored of your past. So all the idol values you have are stored in your will, unconscious mind. Even every wrong you ever did. Something being stored in your unconscious mind does not mean you are practicing it. Your unconscious mind is like a memory bank. So the moment you are justified, in your unconscious mind is wrong, you did also in the past. It doesn't go yet. 
listen to me, fall in your unconscious mind. Is it wrong you did in the past? So when you're justified or changed now, that has to work. It's in your own opinion. Many men, and you can call it to your conscious mind, you can remember it. Once you don't hold it, as a value to follow. Amen. You're not in sin. What do you see? The knowledge stored in the unconscious mind of wrong does not, listen to me, constitute being in sin. Is that understood by everybody? It is only sin when you accept it as a value again, an idol, and let it influence your life. But you want to know when your memory bank will be cleansed? <laughs> of course. Okay. Let me tell you something. When we hit that study on the 144,000, you would see how God is going to use a word want to cleanse that unconscious mind. Then you wouldn't remember. Because the world was going on all the time. That is a hundred and forty and four thousand question. That didn't cleanse. And we're going to touch that. Come, come the new year. Brethren, let me tell you something. Great things are installed for the year by the grace of God. We also want to start back in the building. So we're going to start a class, a theological class, where simple matters of theology are going to be touched occasionally. I myself alone will not be teaching because every one of you have to teach. Amen. So you're going to be put in a position that you yourself can give a theological discussion of grace and faith and justification of matter. You're going to start a class. You also are going to have certain brethren here on a family life program on the way that we're going to start next, next year once we start the building. What to finish here on a, a, a 15 minutes thing on television also at the television station. So we're going to be having a lot of new things happening. Okay, we're going to also have a Bible training class for Bible workers to go all over the country and to work. And we're going to be taught by example. Amen, yeah, brethren? Right? We're going to have all of that taking place. So we have to get that place up make a good um, situation here, and then we're going to have that and lay plans for this country. What do you see? Yeah. Right? But we have a whole host of things coming for the new year. Amen? Yeah. That's why you have to learn now. What do you see? Yeah. And one of the important things you have to learn now is that the change was from where? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's right. Because they're not going to somebody else and tell them, all your wrong words and give you first. Yeah. And the people say, I'm changed. Why would God do that? I always like to give the example. You have a leaking tap. The problem is the broken tap and the water is messing the floor. Why would you go and clean up the floor first? <laughs> Does it not make sense to fix the tap first? Yes. And when the tap is no longer leaking, then it can start what? While you're on the up. floor? Why would God move opposite? Why would God deal with the results of the problem first? And not deal with the problem first? When Jesus himself said, first, cleanse that which is there, within the cup. Jesus puts the problem first. And this is the reason why no matter what theological decree you have in any college, if it doesn't tell you an internal word first, throw it away. Show me that decree. What do you see? Amen. Amen, brother? Amen. Now, uh, let's just look at something here. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Watch it. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Let's see how the Bible puts sins in you and past sins after how God deals with it. Let's see how the Bible puts it. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. From it? Amen. Repent ye therefore and be what? Converted. Converted. That your sins may be what? <laughs> when? When the time of the fresh shall come from the presence of the Lord. Or later. Notice 
What do you have to do is say what? Repent and be what? If, the, if you have not changed within, are you converted? No. So conversion is the change that takes place where? Within. Within. Yes. Amen, brother? Yes. Which one does, does the Bible prefer? The conversion there. Within. Yes. So that your sins will be what? Not at all. So the process takes place where? Later on yes. afterwards? So the conversion takes place first within the change takes place. So that your passions will be blotted on when the times of succession shall come. And this is the reason why some years ago we had a carnival camp and there was this European fellow that came from this fellow came from America and was trying to fight us with the Greek text. And we were showing him that the past sins are dealt with after. Conversion. After all, conversion deals with sins in you first. And he grabbed a Greek New Testament and he pulled Acts 3 19. And we stood up there and told him this guy, that time he was standing up by a drain like small drain behind. And we told him, read Acts 3 19. Repent. Be therefore and be what? Converted. That's the change. Amen. So that, or as we text says, and he read it in front of us, in order that. So you have to be converted within first. What? In order that your sins will be what? Not at all. When he read that story, the man nearly fall over the grave. He just his words back like that. Nearly fall over the grave. But this text clearly shows us that the change must take place here within first. And after the change takes place within, then your past sins will be what? Blotted out. And we are told when the time of refreshing shall come. So the point about it is this, my dear brethren. Your Bible shows you the conversion takes place by first. And then afterwards, the past sins being dealt with. Did you get that clear? Yes. And this comes to what we show you. Sins within must be forgiven what? First, so that the past sins may be forgiven here mm-hmm. in the judgment. Let's look at that same concept in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 2, verse 13 and then verse 16. Romans chapter 2. Verse 13 and verse 16. Ready for this? Now pay attention to what you're reading. This one is one of them that requires me to think and reason very carefully. Romans chapter 2 verse 15. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be what? Justified. Now shall be in future tense. Now let's just stop here. The hearers of the law are not just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Is this telling you you have to do righteousness first before God justify you? No. Because a righteous man cannot what? Do righteousness first. But how come it says the doers of the law shall be, in the big future tense, be justified? Because if you are doer of the law, you have to be made righteous first. When the person is converted, they are made what? Righteous, and then they what? Do the law. Yet we are told there's a justification that has to take place for them after they are already doing the law. When does that justification take place? Verse 16. It tells us, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to what? My gospel. Did you see that? So in other words, that justification is to take place in the judgment. Amen, brethren? Because the person is doing the law already. But to do the law, you have to be converted first. So when the person is converted first during the law, in the judgment they will be justified. Is that understood by their brethren? So this shows you that the change must take place there. 
within first to make it to the law. Then the justification will take place in the judgment. And that justification is God hiding a multitude of sins. That's getting rid of your passing. You want to see it again? Look at the last chapter of James. The last chapter of James. Nineteen and twenty. Did you see that? Verse nineteen. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, now stop here. So somebody turn away from the truth. You preach and you preach and you preach and you can't do it again. Now, let me tell you something. When I was in the traditional of the church, do you know what most of my work here was doing? Do you know what most of my work here was doing? Restoring backsliders. Do you know how much people that were backsliders here? And I would always be running after them and studying with them and restoring them. There's one that we saw five times. <laughs> this is a girl. She always come and then she backslides. Come after her, she backslides. Come trouble, she backslides. Five times I had to work and we saw her. After the fifth time, she never came back. So although I see her many years after, she always will come back. But never did. And this was the work I did a lot in Lamont this year when I was there. Always restoring backslides. But the point about it is that a backslider is a person who has lost their conversion. Amen? Yeah. So when they preach the truth to the person, they become more reconverted. Now, so the conversion means that change takes place where? Within. 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 This is how your Bible tells you. Now, after the change takes place within, the forgiveness within, the person is reconverted, what happens in the judgment? Next verse. Verse 20. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from yes. death and shall what? Hide the what? A multitude of sins. Did you see that? You mean. It didn't say the multitude of sins was hidden first. What happens first? The conversion. conversion. And if the person is converted, they will be saved from death, the eternal death, and you will hide what? A multitude of sins. That's all the passage. So the change must take place where? Within first. And only after it takes place within first, then the multitude of sins will be hidden. Amen, brethren? Amen. Is that understood? Yes. And this is what the Bible teaches you. The Bible teaches you the inner change first. Now this same truth is written in different ways in the Bible. Some of the scriptures that you have to retranslate because they're translated wrong. Let me give you one last scripture. And we're going to retranslate the scripture. Every Bible commentator, when they come upon this scripture, they say they can't understand it. Including the great Martin Luther. When Martin Luther came upon this scripture, he says, in honesty, I don't know what it means. I have to leave it unexplained because I really don't know what it means. Let's see that scripture, what it was. Romans chapter 3, 24 and 25. Let's see if we can understand it. Romans chapter 3, 24 and 24.
Okay, just like the Greek word there for you. That is wrongly translated. And it means what? In showing, that Greek word. The E-N means in, the I's in, showing. So N, the I's in, in showing. That's the actual translation. Now when Musa read this, he couldn't understand it. It's wrongly translated. Let's read it ourselves. Being justified. Is it wrong? Yeah. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the first thing we see here is that the person who has sinned and come short of the glory of God, when they repent and believe, they were what? Justified by his grace. That justification changes you. Let's read on. So it says again, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Did you just see that? The word to declare is the word and the is in. It means for the ensuring of his righteousness. That's what it means. The word means ensuring. Now when you read it, you will see that when the person is justified, there's righteousness within him what? Showing out that God will what? Deal with the sins that are past. Let's read. Verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God, Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation or mercy seat. True faith in his blood, which we must have. For the ensuring of his righteousness in us, that is. For the remission of sins that are passed through the world. For the arms of God. So what we are being told is that when we are justified by faith in his blood, the righteousness of God is in us, and there's an ensuring of that righteousness that God will deal or, or, or for the remission. And the word remission there is the word passing over. So God will pass over the past sins that He has allowed us to accumulate through His forbearance. So it means to say when Christ is in you, and the fact that the righteousness is in you and must be in you is shown in verse 22 of Romans chapter 3, which tells us, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, you see the word back unto all here? Yeah? Wrong translation, it is into all. Yes. Yes, E-I-S is equal, into all. So the righteousness of God must be into us. So that will be shown out for the remission of sins that are past. So in other words, only if you have righteousness in you showing out, then God will remit all your past sins. Amen, brethren? Amen. Did you get that? Amen. And that's how that scripture clearly shows us that inside must be cleansed for God to remit all your what? Past sins. That Luther could not understand. But we today could, because the truth is now here. Yes, brother. Um, how does verse 26 apply to that? It says here, it says here, to declare at this time, it, it, it means it for the ensuring at this time of his righteousness that he might be the just that, that he might be just and the justifier of them that believe in Jesus. In other words, when this righteousness is shown manifested out of you at this time, it shows that God is what? Just. And he justifies you, he justifies you who believe in Jesus. But it is that same righteousness showing from within that will cause him to remit or cause remission of the sins that are bad. And we already know that that takes place here in the judgment. But that righteousness will be seen showing from within you now to show that God is just in justifying you when you repent. Amen? Amen. Justifying all those that believe in Jesus. Okay? Now there are many different ways in which these things are shown here in the scripture. Now what does this clearly show us? 
Any religion, listen to me, any religion that comes and tells you that your past sins must be dealt with first, and then after all, God try to change you, that religion is false. Because scripture shows us it is that God must deal with the sins in you first, and then the past sins will be butted up. Amen, brethren? That's the pattern. Once you hold that pattern, you have the real gospel. That is the real gospel. And that determines the person having the truth. So many people will come and point to other scriptures and, and say, when the Bible says, for oh, sins that are many are forgiven, they say the God will give all the past sins. And they forget that the miracle that God was showing there, it showed a change. So the sins that are forgiven are many, that is any person at the time. So when you are forgiven, you are given for sins that is within you at first. Then afterwards, God is going to get rid of all, all your passes. That order must be learned and must be known if you are to recognize that you have the true gospel. And if you don't want to know it from going through all this, just know it by logic. What does logic tell us? If you have a broken child, okay, and it is spraying, some substance on your floor, on your walls. Would you just go and try to clean all the results of that floor first? No, you will have to fix what? The broken tap first. And then afterward, as it is no longer spread things around, then you clean up all the things around. The logic tells us it is only sensible to deal with the source of sin first before you deal with all the passing. And what is a passing? What does it mean to deal with a passing? Have you ever thought about it? Okay. The theory that evangelicals have in God dealing with past sins is that God is correcting his own ranting. You didn't catch that one. The theory that they have about God dealing with past sins implies that God is dealing with his own rant. Because if a person hit somebody three years ago, three years later they are following Christ, they are not hitting anybody again. What does it mean for God to forgive that person? It simply means he doesn't hold it against the person. But if God doesn't hold it against the person, it means to say he cannot penalize the person for it, amen? Because he doesn't hold it against them. But what if he held it against the person? If he held it against the person, it would mean to say he still has wrath to call the person for that past that the person has now corrected. So forgiveness for past sins could only mean that God doesn't hold it as our responsibility anymore. But for him not to hold it as your responsibility, you must show that you are changed until Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Because when he looks at your character and you see that's not your value anymore, then it is his sovereign love and grace to say, you know what? Because you don't hold that as a value anymore, I am no longer going to hold that against you. What am I going to do? Get rid of you. That's how past sins are dealt with. Amen? But, but by getting rid of it means it's a past thing, it's not existing here, there, or anywhere. Acts that go into history don't exist anywhere except in memory. So it's not to say it existed in another real world that you have to go and tackle it. No. The issue there is just your responsibility for it. And God is saying, since you're no longer responsible, I wouldn't hold it for that part. What do you say? Amen. That's all that you see. Yes, my dear. Okay, so so now we understand that we have to be um, free from sin inside before there's an everlasting change in general, right? Now, what's the initial initial process? So what has to happen initially before that can take place? Because who would just come up on their own and decide that, oh yeah, you know what, I have a problem with sin, I need to fix this problem. Like, so what's the initial thing that occurs before even the problem of sin inside to be dealt with, and then um, in Romans 5, 1, could you, could you tell us where that falls in the whole process? That last part I didn't hear too well. Romans 5, 1, could you tell us where that falls in the whole process That's of dealing with sin? Romans chapter 5, 1. 1. one. Okay. Romans 5, 1. Okay, Romans 5.1 is barely speaking about the first justification that stops us from being enemies with God. Let's read. Therefore, being justified 
out of faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is speaking about the first justification, the first shape. You have peace with Him. And then it goes on to say, Jesus Christ through whom we have access by the faith into this grace where we stand. So that means you have to say, stand in grace. And you have access by the faith into this grace where we stand. And you rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So that is simply speaking about the change within. It doesn't give them passing here. Right? That's all. But as I said before, other scriptures deal with God and then you are. The passing, like the one in the match has to chew. But this one here doesn't show that. So unless I answered you, I, I, I don't know. No, that, that, that's good, but I just, wanted, I just wanted to see clearly that there is an initial process that happens in order for us to begin to even deal with the inner, with, with, within ourselves. Because right. nobody would just wake up one day, you out in the world and sin, and you would just wake up one day and say, hey, you know what, this is not, this is what I'm doing, it's not right on your own. So I just, I just wanted you to touch on that and show. Oh, right, right. So, so now I understand. It all happens with what we call conviction. Over a period of time, God has been living with us and showing us. In different ways, God speaks up. Like for instance, there are times you do something and you get an idea that it is wrong, a conviction from God that it is wrong. That conviction came from the Holy Spirit, but that is not enough. That is just conviction of sin. Remember Christ says, I need this bit of truth. It's not right, it shall convict you of sin, of what? Of righteousness and of what? Judgment and what? That's the three things. So you just get conviction of sin here. Now we also God has sent somebody to talk to you the truth. So now you'll get conviction of righteousness, which is this is wrong, but this is the way to be. This is what God is. Amen. This is the standard. So then next you get conviction of what? Righteousness. Sometimes you have to reach the stage and give some people conviction of judgment. <laughs> because when people are resisting, then you shouldn't be right to come upon them. Mm-hmm. All looking at the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Now, after you get that conviction over a period of time about sin and of righteousness, it is left for you to decide what you want to do. If you decide I'm going to end the wrong and accept the truth and follow Jesus Christ, then God justifies you for the sins that you have repented of within. And the moment that happens, you change. But all that wrong, that past wrong, will be dealt with in the judgment, provided that the inner change takes place first. Is that understood? So that is conviction, right? Okay, but as I said before, not many people make it to conversion in the first place, because many people resist conviction. And what if, as we have resisted conviction that we can be in the truth, in the very first instance, it's a wonderful thing. What do you see? Amen. 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 That is very, very good. So, let's go on again. Okay? Let's go on again. So, this second part, sins within must be, must be forgiven first so that our sin will be forgiven in the judgment. That's absolutely important. That is how the gospel is structured. If a person doesn't teach you that, then they're not teaching you the gospel. So you see, that's how you judge religions and their teachers, those Christian religions that they really teaching the gospel. Let me just show you one thing about Islam. Islam sees the sins, but justifies the sins that it becomes righteous. Mm-hmm. You understand that? Yeah. So that let us say that the killing is not jihad, mm-hmm. holy war. Mm-hmm. So the killing can be made. Do you understand? So what Islam does, they take it wrong and they put it in a form to justify it. This is what Mormonism does too. They take the wrong and put the sin in a way to justify it. What does Hinduism do too? Hinduism says, well, all the right, all the wrong, is one God doing it. So God is behind the good, God is behind the good. And what does the Roman Catholic Church say? The Roman Catholic Church says it's your flesh that causing you wrong. And since your flesh is causing you wrong, and Jesus was born the same from you wrong, he, born, he was born with a different flesh, holy flesh. But since he was born through Mary and inherited Mary's gene, Mary's flesh itself was holy. And they call that the immaculate conception. And so they say, 
Where did you get that flesh that, that flesh that is sin from? Original sin from Adam. How do you get rid of that? As long as you have this flesh, you cannot get rid of it. So you need all their rights. All their rights. You understand? So you have to wait until you die. When you go in purgatory and the soul burn, 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 burn out the sin. And then shh, the sin so wake the way to heaven. So they teach that you can only go by eternal burning in purgatory. That's mythology to the highest what he says. Amen, brethren? Mm. What does the Adventist church teach? They are confused. They do not know what they teach. They say, from the time you are surprised, God forgive you for all your past sins. And then places a new man in you. So you have two men, an old man and a new man fighting. <laughs> Remember, we read that in the quarterly. Yeah. <laughs> so they say, the old man will often the old man wins. <laughs> and they say, while the old man is fighting the new man, you have to struggle and fight against him. And it's a work of a lifetime. That's what they tell you. So by the time 17, five years old, they're still fighting together in the old war. The old prophet just said, 75 years, 75 years, 70, 75 years, is still prophet just said. That's what they have just said. So then you ask them this. But you say, God forgive all my past sins, yes. What is the next word to say? Blot out all the sins in them. But I'm not just all my past sins. You say, oh, forgiveness for past sins, I'm blotting out the school is something. Then you ask them, what's the difference? They lose their voice. <laughs> and I watch an evangelical defeat an Adventist minister who wrote quarterly to the people with regards to that same thing. Shame on it. It was a shame. He couldn't show that blotting out of passing is forgiveness of passing. And it doesn't happen when you know not accept Christ. What happens when you know not accept Christ is the work that must take place where? In which in God. So that your passing will be what? Blotting out way more. The time of the The time of the latter Amen, Amen brethren? Amen. They couldn't understand that. And this is the reason why you have to make sure you get these principles straight. Somebody out of that. Yes, bro. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying that you know, the same quarter, the same quarter says that um, and as Christians, don't think it said that we are continuing to struggle until Christ comes. And the two need to be in us. And one of the insulting things as, as a religion, so they said that in the church. Right in the court, and what he also said in the time. You as Christians don't even think that some divine act of grace could cause you to overcome that in our life. That's why I left. I will always say that's why I left with the traditional Laodicean church, and I am here because it is soul salvation you're talking about, brother, and I want to be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's right. No divine act of grace. So let's go to our third point now, quickly. The righteousness of God, God himself, must be within the converted person by the faith of Jesus Christ, so that the man may keep the righteousness of the Lord. This is one of the most important points to understand in the gospel. Why? Because as we said before, Adventists usually say, believe and keep the commandments. And who does he believe in? You. And who does he keep in of the commandments? You. So they just tell you, mental work, physical work. God is completely left out. Mm. But there's a pattern in the Bible. And this pattern in the Bible clearly shows you what is the core of the gospel. In other words, if, if there is anything you leave here today with, let it be point number three. So write on point number three and expand on it on your own. Now you see, had we had the church burn around, almost everyone here would have been given a project to deal with point number three, and we'll have to present it themselves in a class. Each person will be given a 10 minutes to present it. We can't do it here, but we care when we reoccupy. Amen, brother? Mm -hmm. So start learning your stuff. What do you say? Mm -hmm. Because everybody must learn that important thing. The righteousness of God, which is God himself, must be useful. Now let's just look at the term righteousness of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. It says this, for therein, 
Romans 1 17. For therein is the righteousness of God, what? With thee. So stop here. Here is the phrase, what? Righteousness of God. But let's look at the righteousness of the law as a phrase. Turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the what? The flesh, but after the what? Spirit. So here you have the phrase the righteousness of the law. So you have the righteousness of God and the righteousness of the law. Now please remember this one thing. The righteousness of the law is also the righteousness of God. But there is a righteousness of God that is different to the works of the law. The works of the law you can do. This other righteousness you can do. Let's look at this righteousness that is different to the law. Uh, Romans chapter 3. And we look at verse 20 for a, a background, and then we will read verse 21 as the major scripture. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Did you see that in verse um, 20? Right, notice that by the deeds of the law. So the deeds of the law is doing the works of the law, the right doing of the law. Now the right doing of the law doesn't justify it. Okay, now get better. Now let's go on to the real verse now, verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Did you see that? Let's just stop there for a while and look at what this scripture is telling us. The phrase the law and the prophets, that you see here, the word law is the writing of Moses, and the word prophets is the writing of the other prophets. What we are being told here is when you look at the writings of Moses and the writings of the other prophets, you see a righteousness of God there that is without or different to the law or apart from the law. So in other words, the writings of Moses and the writings of the prophets show us a righteousness of God that is not the same as the works of the law. That righteousness of God is different to the works of the law. And that righteousness of God is what many people miss. Ask an Adventist today, what is the righteousness of God? He will only tell you the works of the law. You ask him, is there any other righteousness of God that is different to the works of the law? He now hears that. He doesn't know. And you see, that is one of the most important things you must never forget. There's a righteousness of God that is different to the works of the law. Is that understood? So why do you look at the works of the law as the righteousness of God? But there's another righteousness of God that is different to the works of the law. This righteousness of God cannot be gotten by works. You can't do it by works. Why? Because this righteousness of God is God himself. Are you listening to me? This righteousness of God is God himself. Let's read it. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Let's find it. But you need to get this clear. You read. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ, okay? It goes on. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called. What does it say? The Lord what? Righteousness, or it says Yahweh, our righteousness. Now listen to me carefully. It didn't say the Lord has righteousness. 
or the Lord gives righteousness. But his name is the Lord, what? Our Lord. righteousness. So our righteousness is who? Lord. Lord. Lord himself. That's what it means. Did you get that? Man. Watch this. So, this righteousness which is God himself, you need it. Because it was built inside of you first. Before you do the works of the Lord. But how do you get this righteousness of God inside of you? You can't do God. You can't do it because you can't do God. So how do you get this righteousness of God which must be inside of you first before you do the Lord? How do you get this righteousness of God? Verse 22 tells us of Romans chapter 3. It tells us, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, where? Into all. Go ahead. And upon all them that believe, for there is one. Now when you say upon them, you say where the righteousness of God is going happen. So it says, into all. And upon all that believe. So this righteousness of God must be into you. It only comes by the faith of whom? Jesus Christ. Now watch me. Since our believing is not faith. <laughs> but we must believe. But it is the faith of Jesus Christ that gives us this righteousness. Then the faith of Jesus Christ has to be something different to our believing. Because you just read the verse has two things in it. It has our believing and it has the faith of Jesus Christ. Let's read verse 24 again. Even the righteousness of God, which is the faith of Jesus Christ, into all and upon all them that believe. Did you see that? That's where we come in. We believe. But it is the faith of Jesus Christ that gives us that righteousness of God. And this is why we showed you before that the faith of Jesus Christ is the revealed truth of Jesus Christ. And it is the revealed truth of Jesus Christ that contain or has the righteousness of God that is different to the works of the Lord. So if you are to get this righteousness of God that is different to the works of the Lord, you have to go to the faith of what? Jesus Christ, right? You can't do it. And once you get the faith of Jesus Christ in your heart, then you get the righteousness of God there, in your heart. So you're now able to do the works of the Lord. What do you see? So when you're doing the works of the Lord, you can't go and say, I do it on my own strength. But who is causing you? The righteousness of God that is within you. Amen? Amen, brethren? Amen. And that is an important component of the gospel. You lose that, you lose everything. What do you say? Amen. Now, this same teaching is presented in the Bible in different ways. It's how the Bible is written. It is how the structure of the Bible is written. It is always written that God with it, you do the works because of that. God with it, you do the works because of that. The Holy Spirit with it, which is God with it, then you do the works of the Lord. Or you're justified, righteousness of God with it, therefore you uphold the Lord. That's the pattern. Let me show you one pattern. First John, chapter 3. <coughs> First John chapter 3, verse 24. And this text is written back to front. So we can read it back to front if we want. Right? And that way we write it up. Okay? Let's read it where it is written back to front first. And he that keep it his commandment dwelleth in him and he God in him. And hereby we know that he abided there in yes. us by what? The spirit that he has given to us. So let's put it this way now. By the spirit he has given to us, he abides in us. Amen. Amen, brother? By the spirit he has given to us, what? He abides in us. Hereby we keep his commandments. Amen. Amen. 
Did you see it? Did you see that idea, brother? It goes back again to the same thing. The righteousness of God, which is God, must be there in you. And that's how you keep up God's commandments. Now that's why the Bible shows us what was the problem of the Jews. They were keeping the God's, the God's works of the law by their own ability. That's what, that was their problem. They were keeping the works of the law by their own ability while they rejected the only way they could get the righteousness of God to make them keep the works of the law. Let's look at that in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Brethren, sorry, verse 31. But Israel, which followed after what? The law of righteousness. Righteousness of the Lord. Had not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore or why? Because they sought it not what? By faith, but as it were what? By the works of the law. For the summer that was, they stopped them soon. So they just do the works of the law to do the works of the law. <laughs> Can you imagine that? When you look at the ancient Jews, what did they do? They do the works of the law to do the works of the law. And stumble at the stumbling stone. And who is the stumbling stone? Right. Jesus Christ. Now you see Christ says, I am the way, the what? The truth and what? The life. Have they accepted the stumbling stone? Which is the faith of Jesus Christ. Right. They will have the righteousness of God there. Within. And then what will happen to them? They will be able to do the righteousness of the law. But they stumble at the way that would make them do the righteousness of the law. That's what your Bible is telling you. Therefore, that is the pattern or the structure yeah. principle that formed the real gospel. Yes, no. Um, <laughs> for the two studies we had from Sabbath ago, yesterday I was one of these gentlemen, some brothers, right, a fallen brothers, telling them that the law of righteousness is the Ten Commandments. Yes. And they are saying every time you see the word law, it has to be the Ten Commandments. Let me see commandments, it's like you're not to be. Oh, I can prove that, or show that the law of righteousness is the type of he says this to us. Oh, I'll tell you, one thing I want to prove it. Psalms 192. 172. You will be there for us. Okay. 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 That one is righteousness too. <laughs> That's what the one they're trying to get away from. Oh, so I will ask them, um, so if all thy commandments are righteous too, does the commandments include the seventh day Sabbath? Then it the fourth clause? Then they'll obviously have to say yes. So then, but is that not righteousness? Yes. So is righteousness abolished? <laughs> <laughs> But then you still have some of them that say the old commandments, yeah, the old commandments, and the new commandments. And the old commandment, the old commandment was done away with and we're supposed to be dealing with the new commandments. So they die by half churches at the New Testament Church of God. So they believe in the new commandment. So I, I ask them, so would you uh, please uh, tell me what is the, the new commandment? <laughs> What did you want? Not in the New Testament, sorry. Yeah, but what is the New Commandment to follow and to give up the Old? Yes, we love. We're going to tell you the New Commandment is not going to run in my heart and soul. And love your neighbor as such. Yes. But I'm saying, when I ask you, that's not right. The 
Yeah. You say the new commandment is still out. Yeah. Let's see the new commandment in the old commandment. Exodus <laughs> <laughs> 20. Exodus 20. Yeah. Amen. Six. Verse yeah. six. six. So Sister Caroline will read this one for us. Yeah. Then she raised that issue. Yeah. Okay. Exodus 20, verse 6. All this is written on the two tables of stone, right? So we are reading here what God wrote on the two tables of stone. So let's see. Okay, everybody come. Verse 6. Exodus 20, verse 6. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So love for God is doing what? Keeping the commandments. But that's in the Ten Commandments called itself. So if that is the new commandment, then he knew is the old and the old is the new. Perhaps we need to look at First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. From verse 1. So we are telling the evangelical this. From verse 1. So we are telling the same evangelical. You just saw in the old commandment the new commandments. <laughs> okay? Yes. Now let's see the same new commandment, which is the same old. Yeah. That's what we saw, right? <laughs> Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah is born of God. And everyone that loves him, that is God, that begat. Loving him also, that is the Christian, that is begotten of him. Amen? Amen. So if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, you are born of God, you love God who begotten the person, and you love the person who is begotten of him. So you love God and you love your wife. You follow me? It goes on. Yeah. By this we know that we love the children of God. <laughs> Did you see that? Yes. When you what? Love God and God. For this is the love of God that we want. Tell the evangelical. Tell the evangelical again. As his commandments are not previous. Amen, brethren. Amen, brethren. Right, so this clearly shows us all and new. Mm -hmm. Most time in the band, the word new just means to be stated. That's all. Most time in the Bible, new just means restated or represented. If I say my dear Sydney looks new, I don't mean that she came to, uh, to, uh, came into existence today. What do you say? Yeah. All right. It's just that she looks fresh and different. Yeah. You understand? But it's the same person, right? Yeah. So in the Bible, the word new. There are two big words for new, mm -hmm. of course. Neos, which means new now come, and kainos, which means what? Refresh. Right? Whenever you see new there, new commandments, it is never new. It is always what? Kainos. So it never means now come. Now let's get to the final point in our sinfulness. This is one of the points. The word sinfulness is so much of a weird word. If you type it on a computer, you see a red line come on there, show it, it doesn't exist in their vocabulary. It doesn't exist in their vocabulary. When you tell me to type in the word sinless, it will tell you a red line, it doesn't exist in their vocabulary. To them, it has nothing called sin free or sinless. But my dear brethren, let me just state this again to you very carefully. And his name shall be called what? Jesus, Jesus, for he shall what? Save his people, people of from their sins. You see, in biblical teaching, from always means away from. Let me show you this. Right? Okay? If I put a, a, a circle here, right? And I am writing the Greek word for from, at home. This is what I will do. That's the word trans. That's the word translated from apple. 
it always means away from. Okay? Proof of it. Hold this pen. Okay, so I am taking this pen from the brother. Do I do so? <laughs> I must do so. That's right. Because from always means what? Let's see it again. From always means what? You get that clear? This word is going to save you what? From your sin, it means you must take what? Your sins what? Away from you. Now if you take your sins away from you, are you supposed to still have it? No. And if you don't have it, what are you? Sin. Amen. 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 So you say what? It takes, it doesn't take a theological course to know that. It's just common sense. And this is why I like what Mrs. White says. She says the best interpretation of the Bible is when the ordinary man take it and study it and the Holy Spirit will be true. Amen. Amen. That's the best interpretation. Amen. And thank God we exist here on best interpretation. Amen. 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 Ordinary revelation from the Holy Spirit. Now let's look. Sometimes you, go, you have to go in the Bible and show the people away up from means away from. Let us look and see if we can get the Bible using the word away with regards to sin and from with regards to sin and put it together. Amen. Okay? Amen. Let's see if we get that, right? Amen. Okay. Uh, there are a number of scriptures. Let me just give you one of them. First John chapter 3 and verse 5. First John chapter 3 and verse 5. From the nurse stand, it says, hey, we are enjoying it. We are answering and saying amen, and we are following Brother Medina's example. Amen, amen. 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 That's the Brother Medina. Okay, Sister Lisa is a pastor. Look, the administration still has to find out if you can have a woman pastor. I've been working on it for a long time. Amen. You see? Look at the woman pastor right here in Sister. So they are advanced in America, American Adventists. They know how big the baby is going to have, and there's no male or what? Female. So we're all one. All in Christ Jesus. Good Lord, the same spirit working in the man, the same spirit working in the one. Amen, brethren? Amen. So what, what, what's your problem? So now let's look at First John chapter 3. Yeah, I'm going to look at this. Um, when Jesus was resurrected, he spoke to a woman and told that woman, go and tell my disciples that I'm the one telling disciples, teach them and tell them that Jesus is Amen. Imagine a woman first find it out yeah. and have to share the message. Yeah. And then some kind of man come and say, Well, let her cover her head. She can't preach in a church. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and that to them is religion. That is backward religion. Mm. Any religion like that, run from it. <laughs> now, let's go. So, 1 John chapter 3. And we read verse 5. I quote. And we know that he was manifested what? To take away our sins. And in him is what? No sins. You see the phrase to do what? Take away. Did you see that? So here you have the word away. So take away. Let's look at the word from. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 5. We read. And from Jesus, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of this earth, unto him that loved us and washed us what? From our sins. In his own world. Amen. 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 So here in John he said, take what? Away and Revelation say what? From. So put it two together. Take what? Away from. Amen, Amen. 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 So you take our sins what? Away, away from. from us. So if you take the sins away from you, it, it leads that you must have what? No more. Therefore you must be what? Sin free. And here is Jesus speaking about that in John chapter 8. 34. 32 and 36. We we'll read it in that order. John chapter 8. 34, 32, 36. You ready? 
Verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the one. The servant of sin. The actual Greek text is more harsh. It means slave of sin. So if the person commits sin, they are what? A slave of sin. Now watch me. Sin is something in this way. When you are committed it, it means in your mind, sin is the ideal. That is the idol. There is no God here. And as a result of that, you are a slave. You can't do different. You can't do better. So he that committed sin is a slave of sin. Now let's read. Verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. Make you free. Free from what? Sin. sin. So the truth will make you free. That's why David says, Thy word have I hid where? In, in my heart. That's a mind that was. That's right. That is maintaining the same freedom. But it is the word that makes us free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. free. Now, go to verse 36. If the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free of what? Indeed. Free how? Indeed. Now, let me tell you something. You have Jesus who is God speaking. And he said, if the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Does he mean what he said? Yes. Of course. So if he makes you free indeed, how are you supposed to be? Indeed. Yet you have people telling you, well, brother, it's something in here that I don't know. Then you're not yet free. Hmm. You see, the problem with sin is not that it is a, a mystery I wrote in us. The problem with sin is that we like it. Hmm. Yes. And we sometimes deceive ourselves to put it in a nice form that it will be acceptable to us. That we can live it while we claim to be following the truth. But the point about it is that Christ says, if the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. Does he mean it? Yes. yes. But wait. I, I see two hands are coming one to Did Christ say, if the Son of Man make you free? Yes. Did he say, if struggling 75 years make you free, you free indeed? <laughs> and by the way, they still don't get free yet. <laughs> but Christ is giving the impression that he is the one to make you free from sin. That's, right. That's why I try to say, brother, what you want more? It's not your work. Nothing you do will achieve that. God never asks you to find a way to make you free from sin. He says it's a work of Christ. What you need to find is how Christ does it. Yes. And submit to him. Amen? Amen. Let him do it. And by the way, he doesn't take 75 years. He takes a fault. Amen. You hear what the word impute means? Impute means a mental estimation. He takes a fault to do it. This power of thought is enough to make you free from sin. The point is you need to understand what's going on with you. If you could identify what's going on with you and where the freedom is and what it is, then you will know how to maintain freedom. What do you say? Amen. Not fight to get the freedom. Some people fight to try and get the freedom when they're already free. <laughs> what, what they're really seeking is to maintain. So let me just take these two hands before we go on. Yes, ma'am. Hmm? Right. Romans 6.22, you're coming right there now. Wonderful scripture. She said Romans 6.22, yes. And I just want to share a text on showing where sin must be far away or away from us. Yes. Right? This one is taken in Job chapter 11. Yes. Verse 13 to 13. The great dust. He said, if thou prepare thine heart with stretch out hands, Towards him. If the nicotine will come in my hands, put it far away. And let the wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. Put it how much? Far, far away. away from thee. That's right. Let, let the wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. In you. Mm -hmm. So it must be removed from within. I told you this thing is speaking about passing. You see, they always pop up for this passing. Yet Job is speaking about putting it far away, what? from you and he's saying that you can dwell there in your tabernacle. So I didn't have to continue to change first. Alright? So now, yes, brother. Well, I was going to say that um, Mr. Fred Paul said that he became sin, that he can be made righteous. Instead of the... When it says he became sin, 
that we might become the righteousness of God. We don't literally become the righteousness of God. And so like West Christ literally doesn't become sin. It's a way of speaking to say this, that all our sins, Christ took it upon his mind to understand it. So it comes like if he understood what sin was all about, what our sins were all about. So when it says he became sin, it needs to say part of his understanding was about our sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. We don't mean we are literally the righteousness of God. Our understanding is what? The righteousness of God in you. So the issue there is the righteousness of God in us and Christ's understanding, the horribleness of what? Our sins are what we have done. That's the real issue, but not literally. You can't become a past deed. Let me just say this one thing. Some evangelical quote that. And here's what you will have to show them. Brother, right? In fact, when I, before, when I now accept, I thought I accepted the truth. I was a Pentecostal. In those days, we're doing all our karate and the karate classes and being and so on. And you know, we're young and fighting and all these sort of things. So he supposedly accept Christ in Pentecostal. I supposedly accept Christ in Pentecostal. So both of us are supposed to be evangelicals. So I don't know much because I never really held a Bible in my hand or read a Bible in my hand before I was converted. We never had that in the house. My father was a kind of a skeptic, revolutionary kind of person that nothing to do with um, things like that. And my mother, traditional Roman Catholic. Traditional Roman Catholic don't read Bible. <laughs> so I never really held one in my hand. So I'm asking him, do you mean that Christ forgave me? He said yes. He said, get all, all the past that I did. He said, no, 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 brother. He said, get all the past that you did. He said, give what you're doing now. And he said, give all that you will do in the future. What's your my poor mind? I try to understand how. So if I think to go and do something, you should have to do it for you to give me so at that time we were hitting, you know, they take a, a, a white piece of wall and they put it this way and they hit it and break it. So that, is. that time we were doing all that kind of things. So I am doing that too, you see. So my turn to break now. Don't know what to say, you can do wrong now, eh? Because Christ will give wrong and do it now. And as I, you know, you know, kick up all your force and so on, you know? They hit with a force and pull off your hand fast. And you holding the ball? He just do so. And my boy, when I hit that head so all those skin come off. And if you look at my hand, you'll see a little bit of me. All the skin come off. Well, he turned it so. You know why? Because that wrong, he already gets to give for that. <laughs> so you can do it right here. Right? So what I'm trying to show you is that the whole teaching here falls. They got up there, my dear brother. And we want to see what the Bible says about the woman. Turn to Roman chapter 6. Roman chapter 6. Again, sin freeness. This is what the Bible tells us. Roman chapter 6. We start with verse 6 and then verse 7. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. But the Bible says, as a man taken in his heart, what? So you say the old man is the old way of thinking. That the body of sin might be destroyed. The real Greek word is inactivated, not destroyed. The body of sin is identified in Romans chapter 6 and verse 12 as the perverted feelings, the wrong feelings. Right? Sin in the form of a body is the feeling. That's what, that's what we are told here. So we are being told the old way of thinking is crucified with him, but the body of sin, the wrong feelings, is inactivated. In other words, it doesn't flow anymore. Then it goes on. But henceforth, we should not what? Serve sin. You see? So the old cause is gone. No wrong feelings. So you're not serving what? Sin. 
The next verse. For he that is dead is what? Free from sin. Didn't you see that? So I saw on some adventures, you know, in the early days when I was in Stamwa, I used to have left at the church. This way, I used to have a lot of discussion with some of the students going into the pastors. And we would have a lot of theological debate and so on. So they would always come and say, brother, 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 brother. Remember what Mrs. White said. If you say you have no sin, you're proud and you're exalting yourself. I said, so wait. If God removes sin from you, and you experience that good, and you declare he has made you sin free, you are proud and exalting yourself? What does Romans no say? 6 11 say? I have to always point to this scripture. Let's see what it says. Amen. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves. So who Paul is speaking to? Mm. Us. He's telling us how to think when God calls sin to remove from you. He says this, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead work. Indeed, Indeed unto sin. But what? Alive unto God work. Through Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord. He said, yes. you should see yourself that way. And you see, this is what happens when a person accepts Christ and God makes them sin free. They don't know how to look for it in there. They don't know how to identify that change. So the thing is still have sin. And as they think, so they do. Mm. If you could recognize the sin freeness in you, how you are sin free, where it is, what has happened, as we are told, you have to recognize yourself to be indeed dead unto sin. And alive unto God. If you can identify it in you and see it, then you can know how to continue. Amen? Amen. And Paul is telling us you have to do that way. So if you close your eyes and say, well, no, 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 no. I have something somewhere and I don't know. You are saying that sin could exist in a person without choice. Mm. Mm. So they give up, but somehow sin is somewhere in you without choice. And you're doing wrong, you don't know. And you keep frustrating yourself, make yourself get weak to this thing that you give almighty power. I tell you some people, it's put more powers to sin than to righteousness. Yeah. And they like to hold this thing in their mind as if it's so bad and terrible, they can't handle it, they can't get rid of it, they can't deal with it. Excuse me, you are supposed to be able to deal with sin. And God wants you to stop being terrified and approach it with faith, what do you say? Amen. Amen. And to start dealing with it, what do you say? Amen. That's how he wants us to do. But to do that, you have to follow what the scriptures say. Amen, brother? Amen? Amen? And this is one of the things that we learned in 2012, which we will emphasize in 2013. Amen. That you will have to be conscious of the fact that God made you sin free, where the sin freeness is, and how to handle what you say. Amen. And you'll have to stop letting yourself be terrified with sin as if it's so big and bad, you can't handle it. The Lord. God has given you the ability to be free from sin, amen? amen? Because he does it, and he shows you how to handle it. Let's read on, we are going to read it. Verse 17, 18, and 22. Yes, my dear. I want you to read and explain first John 1, verse 8. First John 1, verse 8. Read it first, read it. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Really first before. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ's son cleanses us from all sin. So the blood of Jesus Christ's son cleanses from how much? All, all sin. sin. Right, let's be realistic. You see, we have to stop looking at the scripture's mythology. If the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from how much? All, all sin. sin. Then, then how could you have more remaining? Read the next verse on. <clears throat> if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Continue. Read the verse, next verse again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our night. From how much? All. Oh. <laughs> so, when you say, if you say you have no sin, he's not speaking about after you are cleansed. But when somebody approach you to preach and show you the wrong. Now, John here is writing to a group of, of, of Christians in Ephesus. And among them, I'm teaching us infiltrated saying there's nothing called sin, humanly don't have sin. 
So he is saying, if they come and they preach to the person and say, I have no sin, they lie and they see themselves. Mm -hmm. However, if you confess the sin, which means you must accept that you have one, he says, he's faithful and just to do what? Forgive you of the sins and to do what? Plenty for what? All unrighteousness. Now watch me, the next verse. Verse 10. Read it. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. That is the person who say, I have never I sinned. sinned. Yes, yes. Uh, so he's dealing with different ideas. But he's not saying, after you are cleansed, he's still have sin in you. So if an Adventist read it that way, mm -hmm. you have to tell him, what man, you are so long a Christian and you didn't read it that text long? <laughs> You see, so you, you must take one scripture attack another scripture because they're all harmonious. So now let's get back to Romans and we'll see what it is telling us. Verse 17 and verse 18. And then verse 22. This is the way that puts it here. And this will be our final scripture. Six verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, or slaves of sin, as we text of it. But you have obeyed from where? Yeah. So did we change shape place within first? Yeah. Yes. That's why it says you have obeyed what? From the heart, go ahead. That, that form of doctrine. doctrine. That's what? Form of doctrine. Son, doctrine. We text us that type of doctrine. What type? This type. Amen. The type that shows In the this. must take place where? Yeah. Within first. Amen? Amen. But it says you have obeyed what? That type of doctrine, go ahead. Which was, Which was what? Yeah. Depends on you. Being what? Then. Now that then is referring back to Romans chapter 6, verse 6 and verse 7, when you were made free. It says that being what? Then made free, you became what? Servants of righteousness. Did you see that? So if you're made free and you're not a servant of righteousness, no problem because you're still saying it's a servant of sin. They can't be a servant of sin and righteousness together. Why is it that people don't find it so hard to believe that a person can be a, be a servant of righteousness and not be a servant of sin? Verse 20. For when we were the servants of sin, we were free from righteousness. Okay, my dear brethren. Verse 22. But now, being made free from sin and become what? Servants to God, you have your what? Full and holy and in the end what? Did you see that? Now, my dear brethren, what is all this show? All this shows us that the doctrine of sinfulness is something a church must become familiar with as a part of their spiritual diet. You must become familiar with it as a part of the spiritual diet. Whenever a church is existing, if the church is have the true gospel, the real gospel, right? That takes a particular form. Part of it must involve having a diet of sin, freeness as a part of your study. And here is what I'll ask you, brethren, here to do before you pass. And we're still asking you. Take your Bible. Find scriptures that deal with sin, freeness and start going through it. Learn to let it become a commonplace thing for you to think that way. As you think that way more and more and more, it will become a common philosophy for you. And what is your common philosophy is your way of life. Amen. Is that understood? Amen. So let all the skepticism and all the doubts go. Same thing, this is a Bible teaching. So let's look at the four points again here on the board to close off. Any gospel, and this is what we, listen to me, let, let me state this. 2012, we discussed many truths with regarding to these. And the truths we discussed regarding to these four points has made us adapt a way of thinking and a way of speaking that makes our gospel utterances clearly, openly, completely different from the other churches. But since this is so real and so true, we are poised to capture part of Satan's kingdom by having millions come to the truth. Amen. They started with 12 disciples that could hardly read, that had the meanest stuff like catching fish and all sorts of things. And they swept the world 
I'm spreading the truth all over. Today, it is more than 12 fishermen or 11 fishermen. It is more than that. And it is a people that is at least educated to know that there are certain principles you must have. You must give yourself a chance. Many of our problems are psychological. The problem is often how you think about yourself, how you view yourself, and the, social, the, the psychological and social appetite you have. That is often the problem. In this church, the problem is not doctrine. Nobody is teaching falsehood here. Amen. The pure truth is here. And if you tell something wrong, it's, it's presented correctly. We have a church that is discussing and correcting. Amen. 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 That's how it was in the early church. The problem here is your psyche. What do you want? Start to address yourself. What do you really want? Do you really want freedom? Do you really want to freedom? Are you serious about preparing for what is taking place? Amen. Are you going to start thinking about yourself as a failure and start looking at yourself a different way? When the character of Christ becomes your personal philosophy, you can't look at yourself as a failure. Because the character of Christ as your personal philosophy is a success for you. Amen. Because the character of Christ is a successful character. Yes. And the issue is therefore our problem is really psychology how you look at yourself. And now you have a chance to be different and to be better. You have four basic things that identify the real gospel. Sometimes a person says, well, I know this is the truth, but I still want to make you wrong. Some people have issues with pleasure, the pleasure principle. Some people need to investigate what is pleasure and to get an understanding of what is pleasure that causes sin. And the moment you begin to work out in your mind what is pleasure that causes sin, you'll see you're wasting the whole time. And let me state this, the human body is made in such a way that anything you call pleasure that causes sin cannot remain at the same point or level it is all the time. It either gets weaker or it either gets harder, stronger. But the reason why it gets stronger is by indulgence of practice. But watch me here now. When something gets stronger, it always has a point, it still fizzles out. So that the person is, in, is, is left with the physical habit without the passion. It's like a person who's drawing on a cigarette for a certain feeling, and they're reaching height of the feeling. So now they have all this light like cigarette and drawing, and they just doing the motion, they're not getting the feeling anymore. Yeah. They get more frustrated. Yes. That's how it is about the pleasure that a person holds on to, to look, to, to, to practice it. But there's also another point about that pleasure. The human consciousness is so structured with the multiplication of knowledge in, in your conscious mind. Let me tell you this. What in your unconscious mind is a multiplication of knowledge? All you have to do is have some small connection with you. You may not be a Christian following the truth, but you're just reading the Bible. You're at least putting the right knowledge and you're be constantly fighting against all the wrong principles that is in your mind. And guess what? After a while, you will get fed up with the church. It always happens. Sometimes you see a person leave here because of the carnal pleasure and they don't come back. Don't think they're enjoying themselves where they are. Mm. Many of them get fed up already. Mm -hmm. But they're in a situation where they're in a scale. And it's a break forth from the scale that is not the problem, not the pleasure anymore. Mm -hmm. put in there. So the point about it, whatever the pleasure is, they follow it always have an end. And remember the human body could only take so much. Mm -hmm. Is that understood? Mm -hmm. The human body could only take so much. Let me tell you this, my dear brother. Don't, when you find out what is your issue to work out, work out your issue and wait up and see how foolish you are in your room. <laughs> how you always humiliate yourself and put yourself below human in your room. And have evil angels laughing at you and making sport at you. And please try to remember, I'm speaking to the brethren also in St. Vincent here, yeah. and in England, and, and also in Canada. America. 
and in also America. <laughs> they came to Europe also. Listen to this. The point of the matter is this. No matter what it is, give yourself a chance. Give yourself that chance. You may be looked upon as bad and as apostate and as wicked and as immoral, as corrupted and destroyed. God is still giving you a chance. Discover the ease at becoming sin free. And give yourself that chance. Nobody is here to condemn anybody. Nobody has the authority to condemn anybody. Which is say they have no hope of salvation. Yeah. But we are here to help everyone. What do you see? Yeah. And as long as you're in the land of the living, grow up. Be realistic. Be realistic. Grow up. I tell you, the end is coming very soon. Things are taking place all around us. We already warned you that Christ says he wouldn't give you a date. But he will give you signs that it is near. And when you look at the signs, he's giving you signs that you will run and prepare. Because if you know the date, and you continue you to look to run to the date, you'll just be a hypocrite. So he's giving you signs before the date to prepare. When you see those signs taking place, for God's sake, start changing. Give yourself a chance. Let's watch you. Yes, my dear. I'm not sure, man, but I was having a dispute with a lady, right, concerning teaching your child truth, right? And I was showing her how you don't teach a child one thing in the Bible, but something else. The argument was about respecting other religions. So you don't teach your child one thing in the Bible when the Bible is in front of them, and when they're outside, you teach them something different, right? And after presenting the different truths to her, one of the comments she made was, but you can feel you have the truth, and other people can feel they have the truth too. I just want to hear an answer, what you would say to that, because I was showing her how having the truth is based on evidence. Right? They have evidence from the scripture that they have the truth. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Yes, you're correct. I, I, I often hear this argument. You know, you feel you have the truth. The other person feels they have the truth too. The person who is speaking so, who is saying that, is speaking from a point of view of never having any, any evidence that something is the truth. Because if they had evidence that something is the truth, they would know what it is. So what you have to do, you have to try and demonstrate to them something that they can hold to be the truth now. For instance, you go to Jeremiah, which we discussed last Christmas, and show them how you pass the sun through fire to Molech. That was a religious practice. Ask the girl, did those people feel that was the truth why they were doing it? Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me. Yes. Do you see that as the truth which they were doing? I want you to tell me. No. You can't be sacrificing your child and that is the truth. So then therefore, could you have somebody that have the truth and somebody that have error? Then she'll have to say, well yes, you got one sacrifice to the child and one thing is wrong. So then therefore, in further points, it is more delicate. But you could still find out what is the truth. Until then, if you don't know, you are not qualified to correct me. And what I'm saying as if you know what is the truth. If you don't know, you don't even know what I am saying if it is the truth. So just Right? 
the average person taking the child and killing the child, just sacrificing the child. He may say, well, those people saw it as the truth, yes. Yeah. But I'm addressing you. Do you see that as the truth? Bring it back to the church. The person has to say, what? Well, no, I don't see it as the truth. Then you could see something that's true and something that's not true. Right. So if you say, no, he sees this as the truth, then you see that one and anybody knows. Nobody knows. The point is, look, you see that as the truth, so you can know. In like manner, I know. But if you do not know, don't tell me as if you know. Yeah. Because when you're criticizing me and tell me, why are you saying that? But well, you don't know if I'm speaking the truth. <laughs> so then you're not, you don't have any authority to, to correct me. You understand? So this is what I'm saying. That's the best you can do with such people. But let me tell you this. The person who you're talking about, that is not the real problem. Really. The problem is that they're insincere and they don't want to have to admit that they will have to follow the truth because they will have to change and they don't want to change. So they're playing games. Small games. But the thing is that they are seeing the truth. Because every time I, when I spoke to her, everything I, I explained why I do what I do, I put a sex behind it, I pass it up, okay. right? So they are seeing the evidence, they see the But they don't want to follow. They don't want to follow. So they don't want to acknowledge. Right. So they want to leave it open. Right. Right. Beautiful. You know the person you're dealing with, you have to know how to deal with them in the future, okay? All right, so now my dear brothers, in a review, this is what we saw in the well gospel, in closing. This if the gospel don't have this point, it is not a gospel. Number one, there must be in this change, change first, or inner change first. If you if you if you teach and teach that, you're right on time. That's what the Bible teach. Point number two, sin within. Same thing like the first, but it just goes on further. Sin within must be forgiven first, so that the past sin will be forgiven where? In the judgment. In the judgment. Point number three, the righteousness of God, God himself, must be within the converted person by the faith of Jesus Christ, so that the man may keep the righteousness of the Lord. And final point, God giving salvation is the gift of what? Sin. 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 If those things don't make up the gospel, and you're in a revival and reformation, then the revival and reformation is what? Formalistic, or just a theory of theoretical. Then the revival and reformation is what? Hypocritical, just a pretense, but there's no true change. Then the revival and reformation is not what? Substantial, not real, because the problem still exists. Is that understood? May God be with you that you will make sure that is the principles of your study. When you study it now, make sure you learn these things. This is what God wants to be planted in your mind from this Bible when you study it. When you study this Bible, it is principles structured this way. Principles structured that way that God wants to be in your mind. As the feature or image of the truth. Once that is the case, you know you are in the truth. And praise God for that. What do you say, Amen. Okay, now this evening, our discussion is our state of the world address. And I have a whole thick bag of tracks here to give out to you that deals with um, see how much I have to give out to you? Okay? Yeah. To give out to you all that deals with like what we are talking about. Writing pictures, everything, right? Okay? Alright, I try to make enough that you will get one for you and one for you work with someone else, okay? And you make your own copy school also. Right? So we're going to talk about the state of the world address, okay, my dear brother? Where we find out what's going on and what we have to look for. I already tell you, you can be walking in court of Spain and see somebody just rush upon somebody and start eating. Alive. Advice, move from the area as soon as possible. Because such people are proven to be in a, like if they are stupor. They are stupor. They have what they call excited delirium. They are burning up inside. And they are called to eat raw human flesh. When you see that, run. 
Move out in these people. One poor man tried to stop a fella and he got eaten. Mm. The police tried to stop and first refused. I like the description they gave. They said when the police tried to stop the man, the man like a dog on all four raised up his face with blood and human flesh in it growling like a dog. They shoot the man once. He refused to drop twice, three times, four times, five times, six mm -hmm. times, by the seven bullet he dropped the other. The person gets an unnatural strength. Mm -hmm. Please remember, you are living in the end of this world's history. And you need to be there today, right? Again, we give thanks to all those brethren listening online. We love you all very much. And we're glad to know that we, are, we can all communicate together with modern technology. <laughs> and we have more to talk about this evening. And we have our state of good address. Loving Father, we thank you for all that you've shown us. We thank you for showing us the real makeup of the everlasting gospel. Please help us to keep these things in mind and to search the scriptures in the light of these truths to make sure that we have the peculiar structure the gospel takes, that we will know we have the real gospel and that we are preparing for the end. As the Sabbath day continues, help us to abide in the truth of the plan of salvation. For your glory's sake, we pray until we meet again. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.